Hi guys, it's me, Professor Dean. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this Kahoot, we're going to be covering shock. Now, before we get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please support me and support this channel by liking this video. You're going to love it. So go ahead and give it a thumbs up now so you don't forget. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. And be sure to check out my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. There you can sign up for a Next Generation NCLEX review, both part one, part two. You can sign up for a consultation. Maybe you want to pick my brain about something. You can even sign up for a tutoring session, just one-on-one -on -one tutoring. If you're a current student, I have audio lessons available. If you have to do really, really well on your next exam, like you really got to focus, I have plenty of audio lessons available for you. Again, you can check those out by going to my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Almost daily, you can find me covering a variety of nursing topics across my social media platforms, such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. My handle's the same everywhere, Nexus Nursing. All right, guys, without any further ado, let's get started. Shock. First question, which of the following is the most common denominator in all forms of shock? Is it gonna be large loss of blood? Is it decreased tissue perfusion? Is it tachycardia? Or is it decreased cardiac output? Which of the following is a common denominator in every single form of shock? Okay, so let's talk about this. The correct answer is decreased tissue perfusion. So whether we're talking about anaphylactic shock or hypovolemic shock or neurogenic shock or, or um, cardiogenic shock, we're going to see decreased tissue perfusion. Because of the decreased um, circulatory status, all of that blood, oxygen, vitamin, minerals, nutrients that are being carried in the blood that the blood is supposed to do what? Perfuse the tissues. It's not happening. So it doesn't matter what kind of shock we're talking about. We're going to see decreased tissue perfusion. Okay. Now, 11 of you guys chose a large loss of blood, large loss of blood. We'll see that in what? Hypovolemic shock. But this question is asking us, what do we see in every single type of shock, no matter what? Next one, tachycardia. Tachycardia is tricky. I saw 17 of you guys chose tachycardia. We see tachycardia in most types of shock. But guess what? We don't see tachycardia in neurogenic shock. So it couldn't be tachycardia because the question said all forms of shock. And last, decreased output. We'll see decreased output in what? cardiogenic shock. But what we will see in every single type of shock, again, guys, is going to be decreased tissue perfusion. All right. Which type of shock is most common? Which one do you see the most as admissions in the ER? Is it going to be hypovolemic shock? Is it going to be septic shock? Is it going to be cardiogenic shock? Is it going to be anaphylactic shock? Which type of shock is most common, commonly seen in the clinical setting? Wow, 29 of you guys chose septic. And actually, septic shock is the second most commonly seen. All right, so you were close. But the most commonly seen shock that you'll see in the clinical setting is hypovolemic shock. I want you to think about it. Why hypovolemic shock? Hypovolemic shock is shock from what? Blood loss. What do you get blood loss from? Trauma, a car accident, a fall. An injury, right? Anything that can cause uh, trauma to those tissues or the bones and the patient's losing blood, they can go into hypovolemic shock. So it makes sense. Hypovol when I tell you by far hypovolemic shock is the most common, hypovolemic shock, that makes about one third of um, the shock cases that you'll see in the clinical setting, okay? So by far, it's gonna be hypovolemic shock. And then after that, septic shock where the patient has some type of infection, it's spread, it's in the bloodstream, it's generalized, now the patient has, has gone into septic shock. So septic shock comes in number two, but number one is hypovolemic shock. 
All right, which are early symptoms of toxic shock syndrome? Would it be nausea, vomiting, uh, diarrhea, fever, hypotension, tachycardia, cyanosis, oliguria, hypertension, rash, disorientation, hypertension, shivering? Which would be early symptoms of toxic shock syndrome? Wow, only seven people chose the correct answer. Well, I'm happy I did this one. I might do a part two because you guys need to learn this stuff. So guys, when you think of toxic shock syndrome, by the way, so toxic shock syndrome is... It's rare, but it absolutely is a deadly complication of uh, uh, different types of bacterial infection that the patient may have. The most famous type of toxic shock syndrome, when you hear toxic shock, shock syndrome, usually what do you think of? You think of tampons, you know, um, that is a risk that a person takes, you know, if they use a tampon, they you may end up getting toxic shock syndrome. Again, guys, like I said, um, this is not common. However, it is very lethal. It is very deadly. And something else about toxic shock syndrome, like I said, it's a complication of certain types of bacterial infections. Um, early symptoms resemble the same symptoms we'll see in a patient who has influenza, those flu-like symptoms, such as um, the high temp, the fever, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Okay, so make sure you guys know those early symptoms of toxic shock syndrome. All right, what is the pathology of anaphylactic shock? Would it be increased intracranial pressure? Would it be increased arterial pressure? Would it be decreased cardiac output? Or would it be massive peripheral vasodilation? You guys are doing great on the live. Just type in your answer if you couldn't get into the Kahoot. Very good. Most of you guys chose the correct answer and it's massive peripheral vasodilation. Why? So now we're talking about anaphylactic shock. So what are we thinking about when we think about anaphylactic? We're thinking about allergy, except allergy time a thousand, right? Allergy on steroids, that's anaphylaxis. This is a lethal type of um, allergic reaction. Now, the pathology of anaphylactic shock, what happens is with that massive, that severe allergic reaction that the patient has, histamine is released. That histamine causes massive peripheral vasodilation. What do you think happens to the blood pressure? Decrease. Okay, so the patient has, uh, like I said, massive peripheral vasodilation, we'll see decreased blood pressure, the skin will get flush or get red, and you'll see tissue swelling. The code to get into the Kahoot is 344-5692, 344-5692. What's the most common pathology in cardiogenic shock? Is it increased cardiac output? Is it decreased cardiac output? Is it peripheral vasodilation or increased preload? And I actually gave you guys the answer when I was teaching about another one of the slides. So let's see if you guys remember what I said. All right, so the correct answer is decreased cardiac output. So what are we talking about in cardiogenic shock? Well, when you hear the word cardio, we know we're talking about what? The heart. Cardiogenic shock, it's the heart muscle. Remember, the heart is a muscle. It's the heart muscle itself that's not getting the blood. It's not getting the oxygen, vitamins, mineral, nutrients. It's being carried in the blood. The heart is what's suffering. And so what we're going to see, decreased cardiac output right? When it comes to cardiogenic shock, the preload is increased and the afterload is what decreased, okay? The most common pathology is going to be decreased cardiac output. All right, so a patient admitted with shock has a low heart rate. When you're going through the patient's chart and you're looking at the medications, which drug do you suspect has caused this? 
bradycardia? Would it be a PPI? Um, what does PPI stand for? A proton pump inhibitor. Would it be a beta blocker? Would it be an anticoagulant or would it be an antidepressant agent? So your patient admitted with shock has a lo low heart rate. We're seeing that heart rate less than 60. What drug do we suspect is causing that low heart rate? Very good. The beta blocker. So um, <laughs> beta blockers are used for um, as an antihypertensive agent. So it'll bring down the blood pressure, but it can also what decrease the heart rate. So as a patient, as a patient's going through shock, right? We expect to see the heart rate increase because what we expect to see is the heart try to what? compensate. Whenever you see that word compensate, that means to help. The body tries to help. So the heart tries to compensate by increasing its rate. Why? Because it's trying to push out more oxygenated blood to the tissues. That makes sense. So this patient that's going through shock, we're seeing the opposite. We're seeing a low heart rate and you're checking through the patient's drugs to see what's going on. If you see a beta blocker, you should suspect that it's the beta blocker that's causing the low heart rate because we know even though beta blockers, yes, decrease the blood pressure, it can also decrease the heart rate and you know your normal heart rate is 60 to 100. How are you guys doing on the live? Okay, let's keep going. All right, which is not a symptom of cardiogenic shock? Would it be pulmonary edema? Would it be jugular venous, venous distension? Would it be low central venous pressure? Or would it be hypotension, which is not a symptom of cardiogenic shock? All right, only 10 of you guys chose the correct answer, which is low central venous pressure. So I want you guys to think about this, okay? Patients got cardiogenic shock. As I already explained, the heart muscle itself is not being perfused, right? Right. So the heart muscle itself is not getting the oxygen, vitamins, mineral, nutrients, fluid that's carried in the blood. The blood is not going to the heart. Where's it going? It's got to go somewhere, right? So patients got cardiogenic shock. Yes, we expect to see pulmonary edema. That fluid could be going to the lungs. Yes, we would expect to see jugular venous distension, right? When we see jugular venous distension, that reminds us of what? Uh, fluid overload, right? Because it's definitely not going to the heart. That makes sense. And absolutely, we expect to see hypotension because remember, guys, that um, cardiac outputs decrease. But what we don't expect to see is low central venous pressure. If anything, we expect to see what? The opposite, increased central venous pressure. We expect to see um, that pressure in the right atria, what? Increase. Okay. So pulmonary edema, jug, um, jugular venous distension, of course, that hypotension because of the decreased cardiac output. We expect to see in cardiogenic shock, but not low central venous pressure. Again, we expect to see the pressure in that um, right atrium increased. We expect to see increased central venous pressure. All right, which is not an initial symptom of anaphylactic shock. Would it be bronchospasms, wheezing, tachycardia, hyperthermia? Which is not an initial symptom of anaphylactic shock. Very good, hyperthermia. We wouldn't expect to see a patient develop a temper fever in or fever in anaphylactic shock. We would see that when septic shock, right? But when it comes to anaphylactic shock, what are we talking about? Um, deadly allergy. When you think of anaphylactic, I want you to think of a person with an allergy that is deadly, like it could kill them. So allergies time a thousand. So a patient with that's in anaphylactic shock, we would see bronchospasms, their throat can close up, their airway can close up on them. We could, excuse me, hear wheezing. What is wheezing? That is the sound of 
air trying to get through an obstructed airway. We may uh, see tachycardia, increased heart rate, heart rate higher than 100. Why? Because the heart's trying to compensate for the decreased ox oxygen or a lack of oxygen. All of those three, yes, we absolutely may see an anaphylactic shock, but not hyperthermia. That is not part of anaphylactic shock. Make sure you guys review the symptoms associated with the different types of shock. And the easiest way to do that, guys, is to go over the pathology. Because if you try to memorize it, I promise you, when you get to your test, everything is gonna be jumbled in your head. But if you can understand why something's happening, you're never gonna forget because it's not like you try to memorize, you actually understand why. So pathology is the key. If you're a current nursing student or you're pre, you're in the pre-nursing, pre I'm telling you now, Make sure you do well in pathology. Don't just try to slide and just pass. Make sure you do very, very well in pathology because if you can understand um, patho, it's going to make your life a lot easier in a nursing program because memorization does not work. You have to understand. All right. All are possible causes of hypovolemic shock except chest trauma, hip fracture, fat embolus, or dice dissecting aortic aneurysm. All could be possible causes of hypovolemic shock, except for what? What do you guys think? Very good. Most of you guys chose the correct answer, fat embolus. So here's the thing. When we're talking about hypovolemic shock, we're talking about shock due to what? Blood loss, right? So it makes sense. Trauma to tissues, chest trauma, a hip fracture, a broken bone, dissecting aortic. And let me tell you guys something about aortic aneurysm. Let me tell you something. Dissecting aortic aneurysm that is a medical emergency. And what I mean by that, that patient has a dissecting aortic aneurysm. Time is of the essence because if you don't get that patient into the OR immediately, they will die. Not they can die. They might die. No, they will. Okay. If you get a test question about a patient with an aortic aneurysm, they've got an abdominal aortic aneurysm right? And you're assessing the patient. All of a sudden, blood pressure's down. All of a sudden, urine output decreased. All of a sudden, heart rate is up. You're seeing those signs and symptoms of shock. What do you think is happening? Dissecting aortic aneurysm. What are you going to do? Because the question is going to give you those signs and symptoms, and it's going to ask you what's going to be your nursing intervention. If you don't listen to anything else Professor D said to you on this live, guys, or on this um, video, listen to this. There is no amount of pa uh, patient positioning, patient teaching, nursing intervention. There is nothing else that you can do for that patient at this time except for what? Pick up the phone and call the healthcare provider. Why? We need to get that patient into the OR. There's no more assessment that needs to be done. If they already told you this patient has an aortic aneurysm, right? And then they're giving you signs and symptoms of shock that this patient is now bleeding that is now what a dissecting aortic aneurysm we got to get that patient into the or that's all you can do so anyway those three um are all possible causes of hypovolemic shock shock from blood loss why because any uh trauma to the chest to the abdomen to the femur to the pelvis guess what those um uh body parts those organs in those areas require lots of blood for survival. It requires lots of perfusion. So any trauma to those areas, guess what? Patient's going to be at risk for hypovolemic shock. Okay. All right. All right. So the use of IV steroids in the patient with septic shock may cause which effect? Would it be lower blood glucose levels, decrease systemic effects of inflammation, prevent thrombus formation, or increase vasoconstriction. So the use of steroids in the patient that has septic shock, what can it cause? You guys are doing great on the live. 
very good. Decrease systemic effects of inflammation. Think about it. So patient has septic shock. What did I tell you about septic shock? Um, it's a severe um, infection that the patient has. This infection is now in the bloodstream. It's gone all over to the body, right? The patient has a severe um, infectious process. That's what's happening. So what do we expect to see along with infection? We expect to see inflammation. So part of the treatment for a patient that's in septic shock very well may be steroids to treat the generalized or systemic inflammation that's happening, decreased systemic effects of inflammation. It makes sense. Now, something that you need to be aware when it comes to steroids, especially high dose steroids or steroids that patients taking for a certain uh, extended amount of time, we're going to be concerned about glucose. Steroids are very sugary. It can cause the patient to become diabetic. It can cause hyperglycemia. We're going to be concerned about um, infection because remember, steroids decrease inflammation. It can mask the signs and symptoms of infection. So you're going to have to assess your patient a lot, a lot more closer for those signs and symptoms of infection. Any slight rise in temperature may indicate an infection. You're going to be looking at the WBCs. You're going to be looking to see if the uh, CRP is elevated, right? The ESR, erythrocyte sedimentation rate is elevated. You're going to be looking for those signs and symptoms of infection. So I said um, glucose. I said infection. What else? What else? Oh, um, ulcers. Steroids are very, very, very hard on the stomach right? We're going to be concerned about the patient getting an ulcer, even worse, a bleeding ulcer. So we're going to be assessing the patient closely for that. And last, number four, osteoporosis. Steroids make the bones very porous. And so the patient will be at risk for fractures. So we're going to um, uh, provide safety measures for that and also assess the patient for that. All right. Which of the following is the leading cause of death? in the first 24 hours after a major burn injury. There's been a major burn. Which is the leading cause of death within that first 24 hours? Is it hypovolemia, fluid overload, infection, or multi-system organ failure? Very good. Hypovolemia. Within that first 24 hours, you have a huge fluid shift. So in the vessel, you have the blood, you have the plasma, the plasma portion of the blood, it is protein. Guess what protein does? Protein keeps the fluid within the vessels. Well, after there's been a major uh, burn, that protein, pro protein pro portion of the blood, the plasma leaves. And guess what follows it? Fluid. So now you've got third spacing. And so this patient's looking swollen, right? They're like a balloon. They're swollen. They've got uh, fluid and all the tissues everywhere, but they're dehydrated. Why are they dehydrated? Because the fluid that should have been in the vessels, so it can go to the tissues to perfuse, right? It's left the vessels. So guess what? This patient's dehydrate, dehydrated. So that first 24 hours, a very important, a priority nursing intervention is what? Fluid resuscitation. Okay. Um, the other options, fluid overload. A uh, patient can go into fluid overload as we're trying to um, um, give the patient fluids we may try to we may accidentally overcorrect the problem that's number one and number two as um the body tries to compensate um, the, when the patient goes through that phase the fluid may go back into the vessels and plus we've been giving them ivs patient may go into fluid overload but that's down the line not within the first 24 hours infection absolutely why infection professor d well your skin is your first line of defense from bacteria, viruses, pathogens, right? All types of organisms. If the patient's had a major burn, that first line of defense has been altered. So the patient's at risk for infection. And of course, multi-organ system uh, failure, because as those organs are not being perfused, guess what? They're going to shut down, starting with what? The kidneys. You're going to see urine output go down. Urine output should be at least 30 mLs per hour right? And so one of the ways you could tell that the patient's starting to get better, that those organs are starting to perfuse, you're going to see the urine output start to increase. All right, guys, we have one more. One more. 
which is an indication of the compensatory stage of hypovolemic shock. Is it narrow pulse pressure? Is it severe hypotension? Is it increasing lactic acid levels? Or is it increasing urine output? Guys, are you kidding me? I just told you the answer in my explanation. You can't be serious. I'm not gonna go off. All right, let's talk about this. I just explained to you that as the body tries to compensate, right? When you see hear the word compensate or you see the word compensate, what does that mean to you? That means help, the body's trying to help. It's trying to compensate for something bad that's happened. So an indication that the patient is in the compensatory stage of hypovolemic shock is increased urine output because as that patient's going through shock, the organs are not being perfused. As I said before, the organs are gonna shut down starting with what? The kidneys. But as the body starts to compensate, it tries to fix the problem. And as it's working, what do we see happen? Urine output goes up. That's how we know the body's compensate. That's how we know patients starting to get better. Narrow pulse pressure, bad. Severe hypotension, bad. Increased lactic acid levels, bad. When, when this is happen, happening, this is during the un- compensated, um, uncompensatory state. But once the body starts to compensate, we should see things start to get better, such as the lactic acid levels start to what? Go down. The blood pressure start to what? Increase. That pulse pressure that was narrow, it starts to what? Widen. Urine output that was low starts to do what? Go up. Come on. All right. Anyway, that is it for this Kahoot. Um, there's lots more stuff you guys need to know about the different types of shock. I don't even think I touched neurogenic shock yet. So let me know if you guys want to see a part two on shock, please let me know in the comment section. Let me know. And also let me know how, do you want it in a Kahoot format like this one? Or do you want in a lecture format where I'm teaching out of a book or maybe some type of PowerPoint? Or do you want it in a Q&A format, such as the videos that um, I release every Sunday, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time? And with that, guys, thank you for watching this video. Let's see how you guys did on the live.